This is the Comedy of the Week from BBC Radio 4. If you'd like to find out more about any of our comedy shows, please visit bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. But first, here's this week's comedy. The New Blur Album by John Osborne. I grew up in a house at the top of a long, steep road. A few doors down was Polly. The two of us walked to school together every day, from the first morning of infants to the last day of sixth form. Polly could play Beatles songs on the piano. She could speak a bit of Spanish thanks to her Chilean grandma, and I would have done anything for her. She had the neatest handwriting in our class. Everything changed the day Smiggy moved to town the 26th of August, 1991. His family moved into the bungalow at the bottom of our road and Smiggy, Polly and I quickly became best friends, all of us in the same form at the start of our third year of secondary school. The three of us spent all our time together, as comfortable in each other's homes as we were in our own. My mum once found Smiggy asleep in our bath. (laughs) Smiggy arrived as a new boy in school, with that nickname already set in stone. Perhaps a shrewd move to avoid being assigned one. And he was a challenge. I'd never been in trouble before he was around. In the first few months of being friends with him, he was bitten by dogs twice. He was in trouble with the fire brigade after being caught setting fire to a haystack and was banned from the number 17 bus for trying to help with the driving. With him around, suddenly life was interesting. For the first time, I experienced the thrill of being lined up on the naughty wall at playtime. I loved hanging out with Smiggy. Polly wasn't so keen. She pointed out, quite rightly, that he was an idiot. And over the next few months, the misdemeanours continued. He was thrown out of the swimming pool after pulling down the tall man's trunks. He wasn't allowed a library card after being caught drawing rude, detailed shapes in the margins of Catherine Cookson's. (laughs) One day, Polly and I walked home from school. It was just the two of us. Smiggy had been suspended that lunchtime for borrowing a dinner lady's bicycle. (laughs) And Polly asked why we were friends with him. We both agreed that despite all the evidence that suggested we ought not to, we liked him because his heart was in the right place, because it felt like he was one of us, and because his dad had converted their garage into a home cinema. (laughs) Polly and I sat in her bedroom. We did this a lot. She always sat on her pink plastic swivel chair, and I'd sit on the nicely made duvet. We were revising for our GCSEs. I remember being fascinated by how meticulously Polly organised her life. Highlighter pens lined up on her desk, revision timetable laminated and pinned to her notice board, a different colour A4 notebook for each subject. Polly was terrified about our exams. She talked about how scared she was every day when we were walking to school together. Our conversations never lasted long. Every morning, Smiggy waited for us by the red post box on the corner. As soon as he was with us, we wouldn't talk about school anymore. He'd dominate the conversations with an endless well of potential topics to discuss in his loud voice. We would talk about TV programmes that had been on at two in the morning on school nights. That year, he'd watched Terminator 2 and Silence of the Lambs, both 18 rated at the cinema. They didn't even question him, he said. He just walked in and played it cool. He was the only person I knew our age who liked to talk about politics. He told us that World War III was imminent, that one day we would just wake up and it would already be happening. Soldiers on the streets outside. I believed every word he said. He was the only person in our class who had been to Euro Disney that had opened the previous year. He was our portal to another world. It's amazing how little you had to do to seem cultural as a 15-year-old. <laughs> I struggled at school. 
I got a C in everything, a seven out of 10 in everything, a quite good in everything I ever tried to do. Smiggy didn't even revise. He had this innate ability to understand things straight away. But revising was a good excuse to go round to Polly's house, to sit on her bed with my books while she sat at her desk with hers. One day after school, Polly took three cassette tapes out, brand new albums by Pearl Jam, Blur and Bjork. She'd borrowed them off her biggest brother, who had cool taste in music. She said she was treating us new songs to listen to while we revised. We talked about how scary it would be when we started sixth form the following year. We talked about jobs we'd maybe like to do when we were older. She wanted to be an architect like her mum. I wanted to work in a bicycle repair shop. Like the man who worked in the bicycle repair shop. (laughs) We walked past on the way to school. We talked about Smiggy. We always ended up talking about Smiggy. How he always had expensive new trainers. He never went to school on his birthday. And his parents let him phone for takeaways whenever he wanted. I told Polly how jealous I was of those takeaways and she laughed and then it just happened. We both leant in a bit and we kissed. Properly kissed for the entire duration of the Blur album. Neither of us had ever kissed anyone before. And it only stopped when her dad shouted up to say my mum had phoned and it was time for me to go home. I didn't like the Pearl Jam and Bjork tapes we'd been listening to. The guitar was too weird, and I couldn't really work out the words. I liked Blur, though. We agreed we both liked Blur. The sixth form common room, like the forum in ancient Rome, was the place where deals were made, gossip was shared, and the wisest voices were heard. The loudest of those voices, without exception, was Smiggy's. One Monday morning, Smiggy swaggered in at lunchtime. He'd been to see Blur in Manchester the previous night and taken the morning off school to go to the barbers so he could have his grungy, shaggy mane re-sculpted to make him look like Damon Albarn. A ginger, pyromaniac Damon Albarn. (laughs) With acne. He had gone to the gig with his stepbrother Gavin, who had a van. Smiggy told us about the crowd surfing and plastic beer glasses, and how he was worried his eardrums would never stop ringing. I looked at Polly and noticed something different about her. I always noticed when something was different about Polly, a byproduct of staring at her all day, every day. (laughs) She was listening to Smiggy talking, but for once, the look on her face didn't convey bemusement or disapproval. She looked impressed with his haircut, and smart check shirt as he sat reading the enemy on the comfiest chair in the common room that it seemed only he ever sat on. It just didn't seem fair. It was me who had first got Smiggy into Blur by copying both their albums on tape for him. I'd written the track listings neatly on the inlay so he'd know the names of the songs. He'd never mentioned anything music-related before I gave him those tapes. He was as much a part of the UK music scene as he was the Polish scuba diving scene, yet Polly gazed upon him with something that looked like respect. Was there a support band, she asked. How many beers did you have? My stomach knotted, and for the first time, I willingly averted my eyes from Polly. A few days after kissing in her bedroom, she said to me that although it had been a perfect moment that both of us would remember forever, and we were so glad our first kiss was with each other, maybe it was for the best that it didn't happen again. We just carried on hanging out as normal. I had been so absorbed by Smiggy's tales of the Blur gig that as soon as the last lesson of the day finished, I got the bus into town and bought a copy of the new Blur album in Woolworths, Park Life. I didn't stop listening all night under my covers with my headphones on, and it felt like I'd never need to listen to another album again. For the first time in my life, there was something more important than daydreaming about Polly. 
Next time Blur played, Smiggy asked if I wanted to go too. And for the next year, we went to every Blur gig we could. It was the only thing we cared about. We both wore T-shirts that said Tour 94. We read every magazine article about Blur we could find, argued about our favourite B-sides. We planned our ideal Blur set lists. Smiggy was so much cooler than me, with his hair and his army jacket and his fag in his mouth. But for those months, we were inseparable. We only had one thing in common, Blur, but that was all we needed. We always crowd surfed during pop scene, our favourite song. As soon as we heard the opening chords, we'd fling ourselves across people's shoulders and over the top until we were in the arms of the security guards. At one gig, I lost my trainers after an overexcited burst of enthusiasm. By the time I was on my feet again, my Reeboks were lost to the mosh pit. When I told Smiggy what had happened afterwards, he laughed, took his trainers off and threw them in a bin. (laughs) We both walked the three miles to our youth hostel bunk beds in our socks. Solidarity. We travelled the country watching Blur, a picaresque jaunt of student unions and small town arenas. If Blur were playing a gig, we'd be there as long as our mums let us. And Gavin could give us a lift in his van. After a summer spent messing around after finishing my A-levels and being rejected for the one job I'd applied for, I decided I'd work for my dad. He had his own business, and he'd always made it very clear he liked the idea of making it a family concern. I remember thinking, this is it then. This is what I do now. I climb on roofs and fix them. I started to quite like the idea. I'd be making people happy. Thank God that man came to fix our roof. He saved us. My dad always got so excited every time the weatherman said it was going to be windy. Soon I too would be watching the weather with my fingers crossed, hoping for storms. Smiggy and Polly were both moving away. Polly was starting university in Sheffield. And after a year changing his mind about whether to go to Cambridge or Oxford, Smiggy ended up going to neither, preferring to move to London to live with his art college girlfriend, Hemma. Emma with an H at the beginning. She was three years older than Smiggy. Pretty impressive for a group of friends where even talking to a girl in the year above made you a Lothario. (laughs) Hemma didn't like Blur. She liked the kind of music that didn't have singers or guitarists. She liked dance music. They met at Glastonbury. Smiggy had gone there by himself, climbed over the fence. Hemma's friend was DJing in the dance tent which was suddenly even cooler than having a stepbrother with a van. (laughs) He came back with stories of how he didn't bother seeing the headliners because he was too busy drinking neat gin with this new girl he'd met. The three of us met in the pub that night. Polly knocked on my door. Then we walked to the end of the road where Smiggy was waiting for us by the red post box. I had taped him a copy of the new Blur album, The Great Escape, that was out that week. Despite being their biggest fan in the world, he had never actually bought any of Blur's albums. <laughs> that was my job. Polly said she'd been listening to The Great Escape all day too, while packing her stuff into boxes. She couldn't wait to move to Sheffield. That night in the pub, moving away was all Polly and Smiggy could talk about. Neither of them asked if I was looking forward to working for my dad. I guess they knew I'd be fine and that we'd catch up before too long in Sheffield and in London, and when they came back to visit. It wouldn't be too long until Polly knocked on my door, we walked down the road, and there was Smiggy, waiting for us at the red post box. I followed the directions I'd written down on a scrap of paper of how to get from Sheffield Railway Station to Polly's house. 
It was the start of her second term of her second year at university. But this was the first time I had visited. I'd wanted to go, but I'd been so busy working on the roofs and she was busy making new friends. But deep down, it's because I was nervous. I was scared that she didn't need me anymore. What if we didn't make each other laugh anymore? What if it was awkward and we didn't know what to talk about? But on Christmas Eve, she had been round to my house and everything was just like it had always been. And she invited me along to Sheffield and this time when I said I'd go, I meant it. She said she'd take me to the cool indie club near her house. She told me I would love it there. I had bought a new shirt especially. She lived with three other girls in a cool flat with a balcony and a jacuzzi. Not for the first time since Smiggy and Polly had moved away, I felt I was missing out on something. University, girls, indie clubs. It seemed a long way from scooping wet leaves out of guttering while my dad ate sandwiches in the van. (laughs) As soon as we met, Polly seemed noticeably different. She was wearing a dress. I'd never seen her wearing a dress before. In the indie club... I didn't recognise any of the music the DJ was playing. It was loud and new and not on the CDs I had in my bedroom. After a few drinks, Polly's friends moved to the dance floor. Then Polly joined them and after the inevitable cajoling, I joined in too. Nervously shuffling to songs I didn't know and I started to hope it would be time to go home soon. But then Blur came on. Polly and I ran towards each other and jumped up and down, spilling our drinks, screaming along, throwing our heads back. Blur. Her friends danced too. The whole of the club jumped up and down, but no one jumped up and down in the way that we jumped up and down. Those two breathless minutes of Blur made the previous three years rain on bungalow roofs all worthwhile. The song ended and was replaced by something no one seemed to recognise. We left the dance floor like shift workers and headed to the bar for more beer. Sweaty, happy, ears ringing with blur. The next morning, I opened up the curtains in the spare room. Polly had made it all comfy for me with blankets and cushions and strategically placed pints of water. I went to the kitchen where Polly was already making breakfast. When she was scrambling eggs, she asked what I thought of the new Blur album. It was called Blur Blur and had been out for almost a month. She seemed so disappointed when I told her I hadn't heard it. She said it was easily the best Blur album. I told her I just never got round to buying it, but deep down, it didn't seem the same without her and Smiggy around. As soon as we finished breakfast... Polly loaded up her CD player and we lay there on her bed, listening to the new Blur album. We listened to it three times in a row, apart from the last track that she didn't like. (laughs) She said she hated it. Weird droning guitar and strange monotone talking. She said it reminded her of Smiggy's anti-capitalist poetry. (laughs) Each time it came on, she jumped up to start the CD again. She taped the album for me so I could listen on my Walkman on the train home. And the stations rushed past me. People got on and off around me to the soundtrack of the new Blur album in my headphones. I went out to buy a copy of my own the next day so I could line it up on my shelf in a neat row next to my growing collection of Blur albums, the most treasured items in my bedroom. I loved the last track, Essex Dogs. I thought it was the best track on the album. Perfect music for listening to on the roofs of bungalows in the rain. After three years working for my dad, I treated myself to a holiday. I went to Denmark. I had a Danish cousin, Jonas, who was a few years older than me and lived in a town called Kolding where the footballer Jan Molby was born. (laughs) 
His whole family had come over for my dad's 50th birthday party that January, and he said, if I didn't go and stay with him in Denmark, I was a dick. (laughs) So I bought a big rucksack with lots of zips and started to save up. I loved being on holiday. Jonas and his girlfriend looked after me well. It was a nice feeling to lose touch with what was going on back at home. On the Monday morning of my last week there, the new Blur album came out. And I took the train out to Copenhagen to find a record shop. It was the coolest thing I'd ever done. I handed over my kroner and was the owner of the new Blur album in a special edition limited box. It was called 13. I had taken my Discman with me so I could listen to it the moment I stepped out of the shop. I walked up and down the streets of Copenhagen listening to the album. It was the first time in my life I felt I genuinely didn't have a worry in the world. It's not often in life someone can say that. That day Blur gave me a tour of Copenhagen. I walked up and down the streets, by the river. I could tell you the name of each monument, not by its history or its location, but by which Blur song was playing at the time. I can't listen to Tender without thinking of that Little Mermaid statue. That afternoon, I went to a flea market. I saw three kids behind a stall, two boys and a girl, about 15 years old. They were selling T-shirts they'd made themselves with band names across, spread out on a tartan rug, having the best time, even though no one was buying anything. They reminded me of my little gang, me, Smiggy, and Polly, messing around as 15-year-olds. I decided to send them postcards, tell them about Denmark, about the three kids at the flea market with their band T-shirts, tell them how much I missed them. Say, by the way, have you heard the new Blur album? I was in London the day Think Tank came out. The new Blur album. The last Blur album. The one with jazz on it. (laughs) I went to the big HMV on Oxford Street with the escalators. And when I went to pay, I was certain that the boy in front of me in the queue was Smiggy. I hadn't seen him for such a long time, it was hard to tell. Smiggy went to one till and I went to the next one along. I looked across and as I paid for the new Blur album, I noticed the CD being scanned on the next till was also Think Tank. The barcodes were swiped in unison and we both paid, walked to the exit and went our separate ways, me and the boy who might have been Smiggy. I never heard back from Smiggy after sending him that postcard from Denmark. My mum says she still sees his mum in the supermarket sometimes but they didn't really know each other to talk to. She just knew her as Mrs Smith, Smiggy's mum, the little boy who got into trouble sometimes, who loved Blur just as much as I did. But Polly replied, of course she did. I wrote back and then she wrote back. And we hung out a couple of times. I went to Sheffield and then she came back home and we went out for food. At first I thought, this is great, it's just like the old times. Except it wasn't. It was better. It was more enjoyable. And it felt there was less pressure, and one day I worked out why. We were grown-ups now. Actual grown-ups. We both had jobs and relationships and new lives. I realised maybe it was for the best that Smiggy never replied to that postcard. It would have been strange for the two of us to meet up after so many years not seeing each other. In the same way, it would feel strange to just put Park Life on my CD player and listen to it all the way through. When you get older, it's important to recalibrate your friendships. That's why it's sometimes hard to be friends with people you were friends with growing up. But some people, 
Some people stay friends forever. And I'm pretty sure this boy in HMV wasn't Smiggy. He seemed a bit too short. Most likely it was just another person in their late 20s buying the new Blur album. Maybe I'd even been next to him in a mosh pit at some stage. Maybe one of us had crowd surfed over the other's shoulders. We'd maybe jumped up and down, wahooing in the same beer-soaked indie club. The boy who might have been Smiggy would go home and put on his CD and remember all the previous times he'd pressed play on a new Blur album, nervously anticipating track one. And when we got back home, we would listen, me and the boy who was too short to be Smiggy, and all the other Blur fans who had been at those mid-90s student union gigs, all of us saying, oh, this one's got jazz on it. (laughs) All the Smiggies and all the Pollies all across the country, with Blur ticket stubs in our scrapbooks, Blur t-shirts still sometimes worn as pyjama tops, Photograph albums of us at music festivals with friends we don't see anymore. The older we get, the less exciting our birthdays are. Christmas comes round with increasing regularity, then Easter, then another new series of The Apprentice. Then the clocks go back and it's Christmas again. That's why when we get on with our jobs and our lives, our minds occasionally wander And there's a quiet longing that maybe one day our favourite band will record some new songs. First of all, we'll hear rumours. Then we'll find out it's definitely happening. We'll hear what it's going to be called and the release date, and then we'll see the artwork, the track listings. Steve Lamack will play the new single. A tour will be announced. Festival appearances. And people like me and Polly and Smiggy. And the boy in HMV who looked a bit like Smiggy. Unexpectedly in our 30s and 40s, all of a sudden, despite having only just left sixth form, we'll take time out from our jobs and families and loved ones and box sets and chores we'll find somewhere quiet and put on the new album by our favourite band and the, sirens the new Blur album was written and performed by me, John Osborne with additional material by Patrick Lappin it was produced by Jane Burton John Finnamore introduces us to a very plucky fish. I've actually been caught already. I made him put me back. (laughs) True as I'm floating here. And invites us to the Cutthroat World Championships of... Oh, and look at that, it was an eight. It was an eight, they both caught it. They're both saying it's the same as the eight that was just played. Let's look at the replay. The award-winning John Finnemore's Souvenir Programme returns in a new series on the home of radio comedy, BBC Radio 4, on Thursday the 16th of October at 6.30 and available for seven days afterwards on the BBC Radio 4 website.